The Buddha noted that we tend to cling to views about the world, to ideas about what should and shouldn't be done, who we are, and the kind of pleasures that are worth going for. But it's very rare that any one person would have a consistent, structured view around these things. Our views are more like having a big grab bag full of Legos. We reach into the grab bag and we find some bits and pieces that have sometimes been put together, sometimes they're just individual pieces. Sometimes it's half a house, sometimes it's half a building, sometimes it's a gun. All kinds of things. And we tend to pick our views at any one time out of the grab bag, depending on what we want. And so our desires are in charge, and they can be pretty random. When we come to the practice, though, the dynamic changes. We're given two sets of views that are categorical. One that skillful actions, skillful qualities should be developed, and unskillful ones should be abandoned. And two, the Four Noble Truths, together with our duties. And if we have conviction in the Buddha's awakening, we believe these really are categorical. The problem is that they are not just truths that sit there. They have duties associated with them that tell us what to do, what to abandon, what to develop. And here our old habit of picking and choosing our views runs up against a wall. Right effort is defined as abandoning what's unskillful. If it hasn't arisen yet, you make sure it doesn't arise. If it has arisen, you try to abandon it. As for skillful qualities, if they haven't arisen, you try to give rise to them. And then when they're there, you try to develop them as fully as possible. And sometimes we feel like doing that, and sometimes we don't. After all, a conviction, as long as it hasn't been verified or confirmed, is still going to have some holes. You have parts of the mind that are on this side of the Buddha and parts of the mind that are on the other side. And a lot of right effort is learning how to convert the, those parts that are on the other side, either that or to abandon them, and to want to do that. This is an important element of having strong persistence, or persistence as a strength. You have to delight in abandoning unskillful qualities and delight in developing skillful ones. That's one of the traditions of the noble ones. You don't just grit your teeth, you try to figure out ways of making it enjoyable. Find joy in the effort. It's part of the formula for right effort. It's the phrase, generating desire. There's another part that's translated as uplifting your intent. The word for intent there, jitta, can also mean mind, it can also mean heart. Lifting your heart up. Saying, yes, I really do want to do this. I'm tired of all the suffering I've been through in the past. And I'm tired of looking at my own actions and seeing that they're, they've been creating suffering. I want something better. Now there's some discernment in that desire, and you want to foster that. But you lift up the mind. The Buddha gives the image of someone who has some discernment, as climbing up in a tower and you have a much larger view of things. And the petty concerns, the pettiness of your defilements begin to seem seems really small. You tell yourself, I want something better than that. And then you want to carry through with that desire. The first part, of course, is to learn how to side more and more consistently with the Buddha, and to see that as something you want to do. 
because we pal around with our defilements. As the Buddha said, we go through life with craving as our companion. It's been a long companion. Who knows how many lifetimes? But we have to realize that this is a companion who's done us wrong many, many times. And the reason we hang around with it is simply because we're familiar with it. It has given us some pleasure in the past. If it hadn't given any pleasure at all, we wouldn't go for it. But we tend not to associate the craving with the pain that comes with craving. We have a compartmentalized mind. The pain that comes is something separate, something else, somebody else's fault. The craving takes credit for all the pleasure. It's like those theistic beliefs where the God who creates Earth, or who creates the world, takes credit for all the good things in the world, but not for the bad things. That's what your craving is like. And so you have to learn to realize, okay, it's not your friend. And you, you should learn how to see the connection between the cravings and the pain that they create. That's why the Buddha has all those images for sensuality, like a dog gnawing on a set of bones. It has no meat at all, it's just the bones. The, the, the dog's not going to get any nourishment at all. And as John Lee says, the reason it does is it's just got the taste of its saliva on the bones, that's all. It thinks it's, the bones are providing with something, but no. It's the saliva that it's adding to the process. The same with our sensual desires. The objects of the desires are not that Wonderful, when you really look at them carefully, look at them all around. But we don't look at them all around, we look at them on one side. And then the saliva of our desire, the saliva of our lust, the desire of our cravings, that gives us some flavor. But if you realize that's all it is, you begin to say, I, I want to get out of that. I want to get out of that oppression. Go down that list of the different images the Buddha gives of a person carrying a torch and he's, the wind is blowing the flame back at him. The hawk that's got a piece of meat and all these other hawks and crows and other things come and try to fight it to get that piece of meat. And a lot of sensual pleasures in the world are like that. It requires that you fight other people off. So learn to look at these things as the Buddha said, see the drawbacks, see the degradation. Anything will help you change your mind about which side you're on. And this is going to be an ongoing process, because the mind's going to keep switching sides, going back to its old friends. But you're going to get quicker and quicker at recognizing what's happening, which parts of the mind. They all have your voice, but which parts are the ones you can trust and which ones have just learned how to imitate your voice. so you can change your allegiance. And this is where the other, the other part of the learning how to stick with the duties of right view comes in, and that's learning how to find some joy in doing the practice. That's a generosity, trying to figure out new ways of being generous. If your mind likes to be creative, okay, that's a good place to look. Or the various parts of the path, that's what, the one that's allowed the most leeway in terms of your creative ideas about what would be a good thing to give to whom. If your imagination wants some time to run around, okay, let it run around with that, learning how to think about new ways of being generous, taking joy in the precepts. And learn how to hold by them, even in difficult situations. Taking it as a challenge, 
realizing that it's not simply holding to the rules, but you have to realize that virtue is a skill. There are times when you have some information, someone else wants it, and you know they're going to abuse it. How do you not give them the information and yet not lie? That's a good challenge. We've got some inconvenient animals in your hut. How do you get rid of them without killing them? Take that as a challenge. The part of the mind that's up for the challenge, that's the part that you want to lift up. As you lift your heart, you lift your mind. To really want to follow the duties of right view, because that's what right effort, that's what the strength of persistence is all about. Then when you come to the meditation, here's another place where you can learn how to play. You've got the breath, and you can do all kinds of things with the way you breathe. Think of it as learning a musical instrument. You go into your room, you shut the door, say it's a guitar and you play on it. At first it doesn't sound all that good, but then you listen, and then you change the way you play, and then you listen again, you change the way you play. And then you find you get better. Then you listen to other people who are really good at it. You get an idea of what some of the possibilities are, and you learn how to imitate them, and then you learn how to strike out on your own. The important principle here being is that you enjoy doing this. Enjoy the challenges that come. As you try to get better and better. Think about a John Lee working with his breath. Someone was coming in the other day that John Lee was very unusual. He'd go to India and he would learn. Of course, his way of learning was to look into his meditation. How is it that these yogis can lie on beds of nails? How is it that they can stand out on one leg under the hot sun for hours? What are they doing? Meditated for a while, and the message came was that they were working with their breath energy. He said, well, can we do the same thing to help with the Buddhist path? So as I said, he, was, he wasn't above learning from anybody who had something good for him to learn. And then he played with it on his own. When you read the, the steps in Method 2, those were the ways of dealing with the breath energy that he had learned when he had had a heart attack up in northern Thailand. As you read some of his other Dharma talks in later years, you find he has other ways of dealing with the breath, sometimes just the opposite. In Method 2 he says to get the breath energy going from the neck down the spine. In other places he says start with the breath energy in the soles of your feet and have it come up the spine. The point being that your breath needs are going to be different from one day to the next. And so you learn how to play with them. One of the images he uses, he probably borrowed it from the canon, is the image of the cook who tries to please his or her master, by finding different ways of fixing the food and taking joy in that. You've got a picky mind that has trouble settling down. Okay, find some way. What can you figure out that the mind would like? And what kind of challenges does it find interesting? Sometimes it's simply a question of which direction the breath should go, where it enters the body. Other times it has more to do with just the whole issue of perception. When you feel tension in some part of the body, is it really in that part of the body or is your mind lying to you? Is your picture of your body all, all scrambled? Well, try thinking of it in other ways. Many times I've found I had a pain or tightness in my chest. It really wasn't in the chest, it was actually in the back. Or 
or something that seemed to be in the back was actually in the stomach. And you're going to discover that only if you play with your perceptions. Turn them around, turn them inside out, upside down. And get some, find some joy in the challenge. It's in this way that you learn how to lift your heart instead of just rummaging through your your bag and trying to find well which view will justify what I want to do. You see here, here's the Buddha's already thought out the right views to, that we should take as our working hypotheses. Now, if you take them on, what does that mean you have to do? And sometimes it means doing things that you don't want to do or not doing things you do want to do. But if you learn how to take that as a challenge and find some joy in meeting the challenge, that really does lift your heart. So don't think of right effort or the strength of persistence as burdensome. Think as an opportunity to test your practical imagination. And to learn how to side with one consistent view that really is for your true best interest. That way we get to lift the heart higher and higher. Just I mentioned you can't imagine. But it does take something of your imagination to figure out the path and figure out a way of enjoying the path to get there. 